Well, it's the first time that we've uh, inserted videos into the new uh, keynote version. So uh, there were going to be there were going to be some bugs there. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Toledo Presbyterian Church on this Christ the King Sunday. Diane's back. Good to see you, Diane. And she's brought Bill and Jess with her. Nice to see you guys. <clears throat> um, let's see. We should do some announcements. Um, Bible study continues, but not this coming week. I'm taking Thanksgiving off. Uh, but uh, normally Thursdays, 9 a.m. Uh, is the men's Bible study. And the 11 a.m. is the ladies' Bible study. On Thursdays, if you want to make an appointment with Tony, come visit him till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, you can get lots of information from the website, Toledo Presbyterian Church.com. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And then, of course, you can uh, request a prayer at uh, PrayForMe.com. You can find all this information on the uh, website, and uh, or if you use Facebook, you can go to Toledo Presbyterian's Facebook page and get lots of information there, and almost go to church there, and uh, and then also you can be directed to the website where there's just so much happening there, thanks to our uh, social media committee chair Chris. Thank you. <clears throat> and a tireless uh, helpers, Kathy and Paulie and gosh, Tana and Diane. Ah, okay, enough of that. Um, I'm sure I've forgotten things. Today's a potluck. So if you're not here and you're within driving distance, you better show up. Uh, it's a little known fact uh, that uh, the word... Uh, Latin word Presbyterian means good cook. So <laughs> it's a good place to be. That's a good place to be. And an additional announcement, um, please, we need guys um, after the service and after the potluck to haul uh, boxes of decorations upstairs because uh, the decorating will go on after the potluck. So if you can, if you can stay and help with that. They're all downstairs, ready to be uh, brought up. Thank you. Uh, yes, Chris. Yeah, I, um, anybody that writes an article for the Gleaner, we postponed it a week, so the articles are due on the seventh because of the holiday. Okay, we'll talk about that. Gleaner articles, December sixth. Yes. Okay. Ah, Tana. Why do you not celebrate birthday very much? You hardly ever sing happy birthday at the beginning or the end of the month for those who have birthdays that they're not much. I think we need to uh, uh, appoint you to, as a liaison to, the worship committee chair, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll solve this problem the Presbyterian way. Uh, so you're in charge of forming a committee, Tana. That's the first thing you need to do. But then we'll figure this out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, are there other announcements, serious ones? Not that yours wasn't serious, Dana, but other announcements? Well, if not, then let's begin with our call to worship. What brings us together in this place? To worship Christ. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's now prepare our hearts and minds to worship Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in this season of thanksgiving, we're especially grateful for your gift of grace, which promises, promises us a home in eternity 
In gratitude, we gather here to worship you, praying that our words, our songs, and our prayers, and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. And now, if you're able, please stand and sing, Come Christians, Join to Sing, page 267. Am I supposed to be here now? <laughs> okay. Psalm 132, a song of ascents. Lord, remember David and all his self-denial. He swore an oath to the Lord. He made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will allow no sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids till I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. We heard it in Ephrathah. We came upon it in the fields of Jaya. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool, saying, Arise, Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May your priests be clothed with your righteousness. May your faithful people sing for joy. For the sake of your servant David, do not reject your anointed one. The Lord swore an oath to David. A sure oath he will not revoke. One of your own descendants I will place on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and the statues I teach them, then their sons will sit on your throne forever and ever. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling, saying, This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned, for I have desired it. I will bless her with abundant provisions, her poor I will satisfy with food. I will clothe her priests with salvation, and her faithful people will ever sing for joy. Here I will make a horn grow for David and set up a lamp for my anointed one. I will clothe his enemies with shame, but his head will be adorned with a radiant crown. Amen. Thank you, Rebecca. Christ sympathizes with our weakness. The one we call king in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, 
so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Lord, however much we call you king, we fail to follow your call to us. We succumb to the political temptations of this temporary world, seeking power and security, while you call us to service and hospitality, consuming your creation while you call us to care for it, hating our neighbors who you call us to love. In our failure to claim you, we identify more with the nations on our passports than with your kingdom. We pray that you reclaim us as your people, forgive us as your children, and you kingdom to be our Lord and our hope for salvation. Amen. Friends, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished upon us. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Beloved, be assured that in Christ alone you are forgiven and rejoice. Amen. Hear now the prayer of illumination. Holy Spirit, we pray that you enter into our hearts, minds, and souls of those who hear these words of Scripture. Illuminate the internal essence of your being through our hearing of it and through your power transform this link into the stuff of the new life. Amen. Now we're going to read from Samuel 23, 1 through 7, on page 512 of your pew Bible. These are the last words of David, the inspired utterance of David, son of Jesse, the utterance of the man exalted by the Most High, the man anointed by the God of Jacob, the hero of Israel's songs. The Spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was in, on my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, when one rules over people in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God, he is like the light of the morning at sunrise on a cloudless morning, like the brightness after rain that brings grass from the earth. If my house were not right with God, surely he would not have made with me an everlasting covenant, arranged and secured in every part. Surely he would not bring to, fr to fruit on my salvation and grant me my every desire but evil men are all to be cast aside like thorns, which are not gathered with the hand. Whoever touches thorns uses a tool of iron as the shaft of the spear, on the shaft of the spear. They are burned up where they lie. In our second reading is John 18, 33 through 37. And that's in your pew Bible on 1683. 
Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? I am a Jew, Pilate said. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the, G by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. The word of the Lord. Good morning. Well, who's in charge anyway? Um, we've had a little hiccups here this morning, but thank goodness God is in charge. And uh, good morning and welcome to worship here at Toledo Presbyterian Church this day, whether you're here in the sanctuary with us, worshiping at home, or listening later on YouTube. We are glad to have you with us. Now, while this Sunday is sandwiched between the end of ordinary time and Advent, you notice I'm still wearing green, it just might be one of the most important holidays, as in holy days, that's where the word holiday comes from, of the entire church year, in my estimation. Why? Why would that be? Well, of course, Christmas Day is important, right? That is when we celebrate the coming of God in Christ to earth to finalize his plan for the salvation of humankind. This culminated in the next important day of the church calendar, Good Friday, when God in the flesh, Jesus, declared from the cross that it is finished. What was finished? Well, God's plan of salvation. This, of course, is followed by a third important day, Easter, when God in Christ rose from the dead, becoming the first fruits of the new creation, and thus giving us all undeserved hope. But today marks Christ the King Sunday, the day when we celebrate Christ Jesus taking his rightful seat at the right hand of God the Father. In doing so, he declares all other powers and principalities to be subject to his authority and rule. As we have seen played out over the past 2,000 years since that time, those powers and principalities have refused to bow in submission and will not accept Jesus as Lord and King, but they will. Paul says in Philippians, Jesus though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Now keep this in mind as we look at the politics of the past two millennia. Agenda. Agenda. Who's got an agenda? Well, everyone. In the days in which Jesus walked this earth, there were three primary parties in Judea. The Roman province centered in Caesarea and Jerusalem. Josephus, the historian, says that these were the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and Essenes. Most of what we know about the first two comes from the New Testament, particularly 
Jesus' interaction with them as he sought to minister and carry out God's work of salvation. Though they sometimes worked together for the common good, in many ways they were polar opposites. Does that sound familiar? The Pharisees were separatists, and their name comes from the Hebrew persahin, meaning to separate. They were probably the successors of the Hasideans, meaning the pious ones, a party that originated in the time of King Antiochus Epiphanes during the Maccabean revolt against his policy of trying to force Greek culture on the peoples he ruled. If you have a Bible with the Apocrypha in between the Old and New Testaments, you can read of this time in history in the book of First Maccabees, and I highly urge you to do so. It's very, very interesting. By the time of Jesus, they were the popular party, those most admired by the common people. They sought to be minutely accurate in their adherence to and application of the law of Moses. And Paul described himself as a very pious and zealous Pharisee. He said, a Pharisee of Pharisees. In contrast to the Pharisees who sought to separate themselves from the pagan cultures of their day, the Sadducees were from the ruling class. And because they sought accommodation with Rome, were seen by the people as collaborators with their oppressors. They were the least popular of the three parties, yet they held the most power, both in the temple itself and the ruling Sanhedrin, that council of 70 men. They were the product of a Grecian culture influence between the time of Alexander the Great and the conquest of the Roman Pompeii. The first time we meet them in the New Testament is during the ministry of John the Baptist when they come out to the desert to investigate who he is. Now, we also see them trying to trick Jesus with their questioning regarding the resurrection, which is ironic, by the way, because they didn't believe in it. Luke states in Acts that when Paul perceived that one part of the council were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say, there is no resurrection, no angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge all of these. Their scripture consisted only of the first five books of the Old Testament, what we call the Pentateuch. In Jesus' day, there were many Sadducees in the Sanhedrin, and they took equal part in condemning Jesus along with the Pharisees. Both parties saw Jesus as a popular leader among the poor and the rabble, believing that he would upset their privileged position as power brokers with the Roman government. The Herods, though technically not Sadducees, would have had the greatest sympathy with them. In the beginning of Acts, we see them vigorously trying to stop the apostles from preaching the resurrection of Jesus. Remember the trial of Peter and John before the Sanhedrin. Just conjecturing here, but they were most likely the people behind the myth that was spread claiming that, Je that when Jesus died, his body was simply stolen by the disciples, a myth which persists down to this day. And after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, the Sadducees as a party disappear from history, though the Pharisees continue to exist, and today would be best represented by the more orthodox Hasidic Jews. Now we know the least about the Essenes, but they were true separatists, separatists who literally separated themselves from Jerusalem, seeking pure worship of God in the mountainous region above the Dead Sea to the east, taking great pains to study the law, the prophets, and the writings, along with observing extreme ritual purity. This is where this baptism came from. It's possible that John the Baptist was part of their number, though that is conjecture. It is from the Essenes, 
that we receive the Dead Sea Scrolls. They are the ones who preserve those scriptures. <coughs> they originated about 100 BC and disappeared from history after the destruction of Jerusalem. They are not directly mentioned in scripture, although they may be referred to tangentially in Matthew and Colossians. So, as you see, we have the divisiveness that we experience today is nothing new. I'm sorry, the divisiveness we experience today is nothing new. In fact, if you read the book of Judges as well as First and Second Samuel, you'll see that divisions between the tribes of Israel was really a thing which many times led to heartbreaking and devastating destruction and death among those who settled the land after the conquest by Joshua. And I just finished reading Judges this morning. And the recurring of refrain is, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Just as we see today, their society was often fractured along tribal lines. The most powerful clans of Judah, Ephraim, and Manasseh usually led the way, though the others sometimes led or sometimes found themselves on the wrong end of the spear, as in the case of Benjamin, or the Jordan, as in the case of Ephraim. As you can see, they were a fractured society then, just as we live in a fractured society now. But in reality, the fracturing of human culture is nothing new and has existed from the beginning of time. Cain and Abel represent the beginning of that fracture, just as the Hatfields and McCoys more recently carried on that long tradition of fratricide. Now, we just finished a very contentious electoral cycle in this country, mainly between Democrats and Republicans, though the independents, greens, and socialists joined in the fray. Throughout human history, it seems that certain parties have sought to dominate, with some on the ascendancy and some on the wane, each trying to gain advantage over the others. There were the parliamentarians and the royalists in England, along with the Jacobites, the Tories and the revolutionaries in America and later the Federalists, Whigs, and then the more modern parties of Republican and Democrat. George Washington himself eschewed political parties. He hated them, having studied the mayhem they created in Europe. And speaking of Europe, there were 70 parties registered in Italy as of 2023. Wow. And you think Congress can't get anything done. A large part of the mix is in the inherent flaws of the people that make up the parties. This has always been the case, whether we're talking about David and Absalom, Robespierre or Napoleon, Jefferson or Hamilton, Lincoln and Douglas, Truman or Dewey, King Kennedy and Nixon, to name a few. All have their quirks and downright flaws. None are perfect, Paul says. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If they were all saints, there would have never been a need for a savior. So firstly, when it seems that all our leaders have flaws, who should we look to for leadership? Secondly, is today any different than in Jesus' time? Does human nature change ever? Thirdly, who's in charge anyway? And fourthly, if you're a Christian, does the answer to that last question change? Should it? It is my imperfect, in my imperfect effort to answer the preceding questions, the Bible would say that we should be looking to God above all and Christ Jesus in particular. He is the only perfect human that has ever lived, the new Adam, the one born to crush the head of the ancient serpent under his heel, dying yet rising from the dead, leading many captives in his triumphal train. One of the traps that Hitler lured his generals into was of demanding an oath of absolute loyalty to himself personally. This completely changed the dynamic of the German army leading up to and during World War II. In Jesus' day, 
there were many that demanded that same level of loyalty, starting with the Emperor Augustus, but the same thing has played out in many other cultures around the world. It's just that we're most familiar with Roman and European culture. Human nature, despite the best efforts of anthropologists to tell us otherwise, has never really changed. We have the same foibles now as then, the same sins and propensities and faults. When Jesus was brought up on trial before the Sanhedrin and Pontius Pilate, the chief charge was of sedition and treason to Rome. He was accused of making himself out to be a king. The Pharisees and Sadducees said, we have no king but Caesar, when God should have been their rightful king. In essence, they were the ones who were treasonous. In the book of Judges, we see the slow, painful death of their allegiance to God as their king, replaced first with human deliverers, then the first king, Saul, followed by David, Solomon, and we all know where all of that ends. It ends in exile. When Jesus stands before the Roman judgment seat, Pilate asks, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting and I might, that I might not be delivered over to the Jewish authorities. But my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. Now many have vied over the centuries to assume the kingship of this land or that. But when the king of kings arrives, he does not claim kingship, but rather seeks to serve. This past Friday was November 22nd. 62 years ago, President Kennedy, who along with his wife Jackie, was acclaimed as the head of a new Camelot, was assassinated in Dallas. He had many memorable quotes but the one most pertinent to our discussion this morning was, quote, Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, unquote. Now, just as Kennedy envisioned a nation of service-minded people working for the common good, Jesus, leading by example, sought to inspire his followers to lead through service to others, even sacrificially, if need be. There were many particularly in the mainstream media, who declared that the very existence of our republic hung in the balance on November 5th. For a nation that is sought to be a beacon to the rest of the world in the peaceful transfer of power, those sentiments seem to be explosive and far-fetched. It's possible that this type of rhetoric inspired some to seek to take the life of at least one of the candidates. The anarchists of Teddy Roosevelt's day sought the same. He was shot on the campaign trail by a would-be assassin. The only thing that saved him was his folded up speech in his pocket. It would seem that placing our unwavering loyalty to people or parties, no matter the direction from which they seek to govern, can lead to peril or even catastrophe. In an increasingly polarized society, where people make snap judgments of others without regard to knowledge of their character, how are we to live as Christ followers? We pledge allegiance. As children, we're all old enough to remember placing our hand over our hearts and saying the pledge every day before school started. This practice began in 1892. In 1943, it was ruled unconstitutional to force children to say the pledge against their will or beliefs. However, peer pressure being what it is, you would, have been, you would be looked at as unpatriotic if you refused, especially during the McCarthy era. I had a friend in college whose parents emigrated from Germany soon after World War II. 
He was not allowed to say the pledge or join the Boy Scouts, as his parents had vivid memories of the indoctrination of the Hitler youth in their native land. There are many Christian sects in our country that refuse to say the pledge on religious grounds. But, as Christians, who deserves our allegiance? I'm not saying we shouldn't pledge allegiance to our country. I'm saying who deserves our utmost allegiance? The apostle said, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, I'm sorry, the apostle Peter, sorry, be subject to the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood of God. Fear God. Honor the emperor. That said, keep in mind that this doesn't sanction nor demand blind obedience as we saw in Germany and Japan. A lot depends upon who we see to be our ultimate authority. For the Christian, Christ should be supreme. Is he ruling now? We heard from Paul earlier, if he is the true king, does the kingdom of God exist now? Some would argue that the kingdom of God is something that is future, and most Christians certainly seem to live like it is. But if Christ is indeed ruling now from his throne in heaven, then I would assert that the kingdom of God is both now and future. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians saying, the persecutions and afflictions that you are enduring are evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. He speaks of the kingdom in the present tense. The writer of Hebrews says, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Again, he speaks in the present tense. If Jesus is indeed ruling now, even from the unseen realm of heaven, and if our true home is in heaven at once present and future, then we have, we have one obligation, I'm sorry, then we have as our obligation to live as ambassadors for the kingdom of God and his Christ. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was ruling the world, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. That's all of us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Where do ambassadors live and work? In the foreign country to which they are assigned by their state department. As I have said, we are citizens of the kingdom of God. So then we live as ambassadors here in this country, which for the Christian is a foreign land. Many these days question truth. Some say there is no objective truth, that truth is subjective a thing made up for interpretation. There's, this is nothing new, my friends. I referenced earlier Jesus standing trial before Pontius Pilate. Pilate had asked about his kingdom and Jesus had declined to state whether he was indeed king of the Jews. I believe this is because, as he said, his kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom will eventually be physical, but is at the moment spiritual in nature. Jesus further stated his position in that passage from John saying, you say I am a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. 
And Pilate said to him, What is truth? Many today are like, just like that, skeptical, saying, What is truth? They say it can't be found. But Jesus said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Despite Pilate seeming to believe Jesus innocent, he would go on to order a placard placed above Jesus' head on the cross stating, The King of the Jews, in three languages, so that no one could miss the fact that Jesus was in essence falsely crucified for insurrection, mocking Jesus' kingship, even though he knew Jesus wasn't a threat to Rome. Theologian Francis Schaeffer had long pondered the fate of declining Western culture. Profoundly aware of the similarities modern culture shares with societies that came before, Schaeffer, in his now classic book, How Should We Then Live?, embarked on a journey to uncover the movements that gave rise to modern culture and resulted in the decline of the Christian worldview. Forty years later, that book is as relevant now as it was when it was first published. In it, Schaefer argues that the erosion of society begins with a shift away from biblical truth. And to support this claim, he walks readers through history, beginning with the fall of Rome, through the Middle Ages and the Enlightenment, and up to the 20th century, the bloodiest century in all of human history. Just as there are many today who would seek to amend the Constitution of the United States in order to more easily force their agenda upon our society, people are just as much changing Holy Scripture to suit their personal agendas. In his 1976 docudrama, All the President's Men, I'm sorry, in the 1976 docudrama, docudrama All the President's Men, there is a famous line that says, Follow the money. This means that if you can trace the flow of funds, you can get to the source of those funds. In the same way, if you follow agendas, you can get to the source of those agendas and those who espouse them, possibly exposing their motives. Those who question truth, who seek to downplay the importance of Scripture in our lives, or worse, to change what it says to suit their motives and agendas, do so at their own personal peril and at the peril of our society. On this Christ the King Sunday, I hope you can see the importance of worshiping and serving our rightful King. Even though we simply live as ambassadors, citizens of the kingdom of God and his Christ in exile, we must personally be on our best behavior as Peter stated, and seek the common good in all we do, but always, always in light of Scripture. During World War II, especially in 1939-40, to 40, there were many consuls in Europe from foreign countries who were able to write visas for Jews to leave Europe, especially Germany and the Soviet Union, to relocate them to other nations where they would be safe. Some of these are known and celebrated, but many are not. They were simply compassionate people who saw a need and stepped up to help, often at great personal risk. We are in the midst of a war today, my friends, a spiritual war waged not for territory, but for the souls of people. Paul said, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Let us therefore serve Jesus by helping those who are lost to gain citizenship in his kingdom. Who knows who you might meet someday in glory, who could say they owe their eternal salvation to some kind word or action you performed on their behalf in the name of your king. Who's in charge of our lives, our nation, of the universe? Jesus lives. Jesus loves. Jesus rules. Jesus is king. Amen. Amen.
Now, if you're able, please stand and join in our hymn of response. Crown him with many crowns, page 268 in your hymnal. The Lord God is Alpha and Omega, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. All that is, all that was, and all there will be belongs to God. Let us now return to God in part. What is God's in whole? Please join me in the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Holy One, we pray that you take these gifts of our labor, our wealth, our time, and our lives, and use them to express your everlasting kingdom of love in this world. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. From Psalm 117, praise the Lord, all you nations, extol all you people and your praise today. Rebecca. Well, I missed you all last week, but I had a wonderful time with granddaughters on a cruise down the warm weather. <laughs> and last night I got family that made it up safely driving from Oakland and they're going to join us at the potluck dinner, so I'm very happy. <laughs> wonderful. 
wonderful. Sandy? <laughs> I just praise God for the inspiration, for Pastor Tony's leadership with the men's group to get behind this. It's been a dream of mine for several years, and next year we are doing all 18 of that age group in Tool. Yeah, it's a little more expensive, but it's going to be well worth it. Amen. Amen, and praise God. Thank you, Sandy. Diane? I have a prayer request. Um, I had put it out last month that I had a friend whose sister was passing from pancreatic cancer. She's taking a downward turn right at the holidays, and they're all at the hospital with her. So prayers for Marky, Jennifer, and their sister Sandy. Thank you for that. We do pray. Sandy? Thank and you. Esther and Dan. Yes. Yeah. For all those who are not able to be with us today for whatever. Chris. Uh, Harley's uh, procedure was changed from Monday to Wednesday, so please remember him in your prayers on, on Wednesday. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Carrie. Prayers for our first responders, people that help us for the sermon we received. I mean, it, it took effort, and I'm thankful that that man gets up every Sunday mm -hmm. without fail. Thank you. Praise God. <laughs> Thank you. Polly. Uh, praise for um, the Toledo Neighbors Program. Uh, yesterday, they served 132 people. Wow. In less than an hour, it seemed like. Thank you. And I have one connected with that before before Chris, okay. we won't forget you. Um, Karen and I, and Laura Lee and Lauren, uh, and Megan also went to Turkey Bingo at the grade school on Friday night. I am not a bingo fan. I think it's like watching paint dry. <laughs> but it was good for us to be there. Amber from Toledo Neighbors was tickled pink to see us there. The Lions gave away 80 turkeys, and I don't know how many chickens that night. So a lot of people will have their Thanksgiving made a lot more festive this season. Thank you. Thank you. 
Chris. I just wanted to praise, um, say praises to Polly. I don't know how we would manage to keep on track without her efforts, and she does so much to besides that. Thank you, Polly. She had to learn new skills today to. <laughs> <laughs> she does a good job keeping your mind. Well, there you go. <laughs> Very practiced. <laughs> <laughs> that is a faithful dog. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Wanda. To the one who reigns over all creation, the Almighty, the Lord of peace, the Lord of love, Lord of life, Lord of lords, King of our hearts, King of the kingdom, with no end, King of the Kings, Christ, Messiah, Anointed One, Word of God, we raise our prayers to you, trusting that you, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, hear and intercede on our behalf. Hear us as we pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, if you're able, please stand for our closing hymn. be seated for the postlude.
And that is the signal that people are ready for food. <laughs> so with that in mind, let's uh, stand if you're able. Let us pray first for our meal to come. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can gather together in thanksgiving for one another, for this church, for this nation, and most of all, for you. Please, O oh God, bless our food and our fellowship together in the name of Jesus. Beloved, the church in both its worship and its ministry is a sign of the reign of Christ. Jesus' reign is both a present reality and a promise of the future. In an age hostile to the reign of God, the church worships and serves, confident that Jesus' rule has been established and with hope firmly rooted in the ultimate triumph of Christ. Thank you, Christ Jesus, for the gift of this day and all the blessings that will come throughout it. Strengthen us to heed your call to be ambassadors and agents of love and change in this world. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.